the beginning around the 2000 and it uh, has grown up in a very fast rate once again just as in uh, the western hemisphere of the European Union. Uh, this is a third background uh, showing only the East European part of the European Union, the new member states, and you can see that uh, like a rocket, uh, the uh, debt uh, went up and once again the big, from the beginning uh, around 2000 or uh, from the beginning of this uh, new millennium. Um, what were the reasons for this indebtedness? Uh, according to my explanation, uh, uh, the reason for the indebtedness are uh, the liberalization of the financial market within the European Union. Here you can see the main steps of the liberalization of uh, the financial markets. You know that even uh, in the very beginning, in the Treaty of Rome, uh, there was uh, some remarks uh, uh, they made about the principle for a single European financial service market. So uh, they did uh, uh, very early. But for two decades, uh, nothing happened. For almost three decades, uh, nothing happened. And these three decades was the time period when the European, uh, the common market in, in, uh, in that time developed in a very fast rate when the unemployed, unemployment was uh, around 2% or something like that in the West and uh, when uh, this uh, uh, European um, social model, uh, uh, the social Europe has developed. But uh, in the late uh, uh, 80s and uh, the early uh, 90s everything uh, changed. You can see that in 1985 the single European Act already scheduled a single market for uh, the capital movement and then came the liberalization of the capital control and uh, then uh, in the uh, 90s uh, uh, they were uh, given uh, the right to every European bank uh, as if they were uh, host in another country, that is a uh, host country principle, and uh, which uh, was coupled with uh, bank privatization, uh, which intensifies the financial liberalization. And then you can see that uh, the main reason for this indebtedness was uh, uh, the introduction of the euro and uh, the financial liberalization, uh, which uh, it was uh, developed by the financial service action which made free way for borrowing and invest, uh, investment from abroad. Uh, you, so I only wanted to show up that uh, there, uh, there were uh, definite measures which led to a situation uh, which uh, created uh, this uh, unbearable debt uh, in at least half of the countries of the European Union. Um, you want according uh, or uh, as a consequence of uh, this uh, financial market liberalization, uh, very serious unequilibrium developed uh, in uh, within the countries of the European Union. From this chart, you can see the export and import balance for the period from 2000 to 2009. You can see that there are surplus countries like Germany, the Netherlands, Sweden, Finland, and uh, there are uh, uh, countries where the import were uh, much higher than the export, and this is Spain, the deficit countries, Spain, United Kingdom, but actually in the case of the United Kingdom, the income will compensate this. Italy, uh, Portugal, uh, Poland, Romania, Hungary, uh, uh, I uh, left out uh, several countries because uh, it would be too much for a uh, chart, but uh, you can see that uh, this, except uh, the United Kingdom, these are the countries which uh, actually 
most with the uh, uh, liberalization of the financial market. Uh, now it is uh, uh, another interesting diagram. It shows the income payment. You know that uh, the income payment means it is uh, one row in the so-called balance of uh, payments. Every uh, data comes from the Eurostat uh, statistics. And uh, uh, this income, net income flow means uh, the net payments on debt, the interest payments, and also uh, the capital gain, which uh, uh, was repatriated and taken out in a given country or taken in in a given country. You can see that uh, there are losers and winners of this financial liberalization. The winners are the uh, United Kingdom, France, Germany, Belgium, Sweden, and the losers are Ireland, for instance, and uh, where, where the private uh, debt uh, were transformed into uh, government debt, Spain, Italy, uh, Luxembourg, uh, was not really Luxembourg has a special uh, uh, situation, you know that but Poland, uh, Greece, uh, Czech Republic. So you can see that it, 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 it relates once again a long time period for a, a, a 10 year time period and uh, you can see that uh, during this uh, period a lot of money was uh, streaming from the so-called periphery to the central countries of the European Union. The next chart once again uh, shows something and it is the current account balance. Once again for a 10 years uh, uh, period because it is uh, this uh, 2000 and 2009 is a uh, closed intervallum, which means that uh, uh, both years included. This uh, takes the 10 years. Uh, once you can see that <coughs> the periphery usually has a negative uh, current account balance and this is uh, the reason of the accumulated debt in these countries. You can see that it is a big uh, sum of money. And there are naturally several countries <coughs> who actually have been uh, on, on uh, this uh, income transfer from one country to another. Um, it is <coughs> on the table about the general government deficit. Once again, for this 10 years period, I only <coughs> want to show with this uh, uh, table that uh, as regards the general government deficit, it has usually not uh, connected with the indebtedness. Because now the uh, commission usually says uh, to the indebted countries that they have to cut down uh, the government uh, expenditure, the government uh, uh, deficit, and it will be the solution of the indebtedness. You can see, for instance, that uh, Estonia, who is a um, Indebted, very much indebted country has uh, actually positive general uh, government uh, balance and Bulgaria also. Ireland, which is uh, probably the most indebted country because uh, uh, in relation to the GDP, its uh, debt is some 1000%. In Ireland, uh, there was hardly uh, very little uh, general government uh, deficit. So it means that the debt which accumulated has nothing to do with the general government deficit, except probably Greece, where uh, the general government deficit in this time period was uh, uh, rather high, but I need a calculation that uh, Greece uh, has twice as much uh, foreign debt as uh, it would come from only from the general government deficit. So it means that the reason behind are usually the speculation and the extremely high uh, interest rates uh, to finance uh, the uh, soaring debt. Um, uh, this diagram shows that uh, the FDI, the foreign direct investments, you can see that, uh, and it is a uh, so-called net stock, it means that uh, 
almost every country has uh, uh, some investment into another, and other countries has investment in the given country. So it means that uh, we are, uh, this uh, best book is negative are the peripheries, uh, Bulgaria, Malta, Hungary, and so on. Why this diagram is interesting? Because in these countries, uh, so called by the state, uh, so called uh, dual economy developed, which means that uh, uh, in their economy, the international uh, enterprises, the multinational enterprises, play a very, a very big role. For instance, you can see that in uh, Bulgaria, uh, the net FPI strokes once uh, 100% of the, the GDP. Uh, and uh, the main problem is that uh, this capital creates very few jobs in these countries, but in the same time destroys the uh, home industries. And uh, the home industries actually have no connection with, uh, with these uh, multinational companies. And uh, this uh, diagram shows clearly that uh, which is the difference of the so-called periphery of the European Union and the four countries. Um, how the Commission want uh, to solve uh, this indebtedness problem? Uh, first of all, you know that uh, they established the European uh, Financial Stability Facility with uh, 440 million euros, and it is supposed that the IMF will give it to 60 uh, billion, so it is a uh, 500 million uh, package, uh, which uh, will work uh, from 2013. And uh, the other mean uh, to tackle with uh, indebtedness is the so called European semester, which uh, main aim is uh, to somehow to force uh, the basic kit area to be met. Uh, I can hardly think that uh, this uh, policy of the Commission will reach any results uh, because uh, this international indebtedness of these countries uh, is not the fault of the individual countries. And uh, as I showed you, that uh, it has almost uh, no connection with the general government deficit. Uh, from which comes uh, that uh, to cut uh, down the government expenses will not solve the problem, only uh, first uh, force these countries into a negative uh, spiral of the economy, if you keep down the economy, prevent uh, from growth. Uh, but the whole thing comes from the financial deregulation and the huge differences among the economies. Uh, uh, of these uh, core and uh, peripheral countries. But, um, a story about it. When uh, I arrived first time in the European Parliament, I was introduced uh, to somebody who actually did it with Hungary and wrote uh, uh, the paper about Hungary, that whether Hungary is suitable to be member of the European Union. And I told him that, uh, you agree that we are uh, uh, we are ready for uh, joining to the European Union, but it is the so-called uh, Copenhagen criteria, which uh, the, five, the fifth point of the criteria says that uh, uh, new members can join to the Euro European Union if they are able to compete on the common market. But I, I, I told him that uh, everybody knows this new country will unable to compete with the big multinational firms. And, uh, he uh, took his shoulder and said that uh, you declare yourself that you can compete on the common markets. <laughs> why, to, why to complain? And, and he was right. We wanted uh, to join to them against the fact that it was clear that uh, our companies are unable to uh, compete uh, with uh, uh, well established and, and developed uh, uh, German firms, for instance. Um, uh, this um, financial uh, problems, uh, indebtedness was enhanced by uh, the common currency, and uh, we will speak a lot of uh, later about it. 
And um, uh, one statement, but I calculated after it that uh, uh, these debts which accumulated can never be repaid. So it, it must be clear that Ireland, Hungary, Greece, or any other countries will be unable to pay back this uh, debt. It is impossible. So we have to find some uh, other solution and probably we have to go back to case and, and, and create an international clear union and uh, try to solve the problem. He pro uh, proposed uh, it uh, uh, in uh, 1944 in the Bretton Woods Conference uh, instead of the IMF, which uh, later was created. Um, this indebtedness prevents these countries from growth. It, is, it can be seen clearly, I don't want to say uh, much about it. And uh, uh, finally, that most of the Europe, uh, European Union countries are in debt trap. So it means that we are unable uh, to go out from this trap uh, uh, with the common means. Uh, with which uh, the, uh, uh, the leadership of the European Union, the European Commission, want to solve the problems. Um, uh, if you uh, read the Financial Times, for instance, there are uh, more and more articles, even the Financial Times, that uh, uh, we have, uh, I mean, that the European Union have uh, two unacceptable options. First, uh, uh, that uh, we have to create a fiscal union, which actually would be the United States of Europe. Then Germans, for instance, without any word, would uh, pay for the weak debt, because actually the weak debt was created because Germans sell more, exported more to Greece than Greece to Germany, and the German bank financed it. And it uh, can it be done vice versa uh, if uh, there is not a compromise which uh, somehow uh, make equilibrium between uh, the German and the Greek uh, foreign trade. So this is one which uh, usually uh, don't accept uh, uh, Greek part of the European uh, people will never accept the United States of Europe. And also the fiscal union, uh, I don't think so that for instance Germans wants to accept it. The other impossible or unacceptable option, the break of the Eurozone, which probably can lead uh, to the uh, um, disintegration of the whole union. Now the question to the workshop is that uh, is there any other option? And now you have the floor. Uh, I would propose that uh, for each uh, um, panelist uh, to speak around uh, 15 minutes and let you begin. Oh. <laughs> Probably you can come here and, and it is uh, much easier. The, 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 micro, the microphone? No. Yes. Well, am I understanding it? Oh, I think it is better. I think it is better. Thank you. Well, I understand it well, but it is much better, but I will give it to you somehow. Does it work? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be here and many thanks for this invitation. I'll try to do my best. Um, I took um, as a headline of my, my statement, will the monetary union collapse or will the present trouble lead into a European superstate? Uh, first of all, and, and let me apologize uh, because my English is not brilliant enough uh, to give you a free speech. Uh, without referring to a written statement. Therefore, I will give you a short lecture. I hope it will not be too academic and not too uh, tiring. Um, but you are free to interrupt me if there are any, any uh, problems or questions. Um, how should I begin? Um, I found in, uh, in the daily newspaper this nice picture 
this is uh, the blue of the old uh, European uh, super couple. They seem to well enough again, <laughs> but uh, we always differ. Uh, I will not have uh, time enough uh, to, to, to uh, give some comments, but if we will have time, I will try to, to say a few words about it. Well, uh, and the former Austrian Chancellor, uh, Mr. Gusenbauer, who was in office in 2007 and two, uh, 2008, once stated in relation to the financial crisis, which began in the year already, I do not want to imagine where we would stand today if we did not have the euro. The euro is the only currency which was not attacked by speculation. It has established itself on the market as the strongest currency and it functions as a stability anchor. Well, um, at the first glance, at the first look, he may be right. But if you go deeper, you can doubt it. This statement, in my view, is only correct from the point of view of the financial market managers. Because um, their specific interests uh, will be uh, uh, for their, for, for their uh, speculative activities will, will may have been finished by the common currency. Um, and you can read in the, in the American newspapers that um, the euro will, is not a good thing for, for, for the, for the uh, investment bankers. Um, uh, it applies, in my uh, view, only within the context of financial markets uh, and not in terms of the, uh, what we call in the, in the uh, economic theory real economy. Real economy means this is real economy. Uh, the building is real economy. Um, it's an investment. And this we could see. What we cannot see is how it is financed. Uh, this is a financial economy. And I will deal with mainly with uh, problems of the real economy. Um, um, and there uh, is no reason, in my view, to forget all the economic and social disparities between Euro countries putting the monetary union. I will use, uh, use the abbreviation and you, and you uh, at risk even of its colors. In particular, uh, if compensation mechanisms uh, are not sufficient in, um, in the absence of these uh, well-known criteria developed by the uh, optimum currency area theory. I will use the abbreviation OCA, OCA optimum currency area. Um, uh, I'm not an expert in, in banking matters and business, so um, in the following I shall mainly deal with, with, with the problems of these uh, OCA uh, criteria. Uh, and in my opinion, um, the problems may be um, uh, aggravated by the financial crisis. They, they had been already pre uh, present uh, 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 even earlier in terms of the real economy. Um, exactly 50 years ago, um, a, a, a famous article was published in the American Economic Review, uh, 1961, by an economist um, a Canadian economist Robert Mandel, um, it was titled A Theory of Optimum Currency Areas, and he was awarded this uh, awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1999. Um, it was the same year when the uh, third stage uh, of the MU was uh, introduced. Um, a remarkable, remar remarkable points. Uh, there was a lot of uh, empirical research done by American and even German economists in the early 90s uh, testing this theory. And uh, the results had been well known in those years uh, of the early 1990s when we, the Austrian 
um, had our negotiations joining the EU. Um, and we, you know, we, we had been on the same starting point uh, as the old member states concerning the uh, Maastricht uh, uh, Treaty and uh, the uh, establishment of the Monetary Union. And in that time, I was a civil, service, civil servant in the Austrian Ministry of Finance involved in preparing these negotiations. And as civil servants in the role of econ economic policy advisors, we called our political leaders' attention, of course, to these problems, whether we have an optimum currency area or not. And we told them, yes, you can do it, but be aware uh, it is a project under risk that only can minimize um, if the implications of these, uh, uh, if the implications will be considered carefully, and these implications are told by uh, means of the OCA uh, theory, and we had even Mandel in, invited uh, to give us a lecture in Vienna in those days. Well, um, let me come now to to, uh, to the highlights of this OCA theory. It postulates that the EU candidate countries should form an area which is sufficiently similar, if not homogeneous, from an economic and social point of view. Uh, this concerns common economic and social standards and performances. Uh, the idea is it should provide a stable basis for a common currency. Um, as MU means centralization of monetary policy, and giving up uh, national exchange rate autonomy, uh, asymmetric economic shocks, shocks cannot be absorbed by national exchange rate policy any longer, in particular by devaluation of the national currency to regain competitiveness of uh, national goods and services on the world market. This, is, this may lead uh, the Greeks uh, at the moment urgently. The OCA theory therefore developed criteria or conditions which justify keeping up exchange rate autonomy by entering the EU. These are in particular, first, sufficient, unit, uh, sufficient flexibility of wages in the future EU. Second, you need sufficient labor mobility uh, in, in the future EU. Uh, that's to say within and between the MU member candidates. And third, you need freedom of capital mobility within the MU. And uh, last point is a more technical point. Um, the economists call it stability of the real exchange rate behavior or variability between the candidate countries. Uh, and this is measured by the price level and the cost ratios in real terms. Real terms means here without inflation. Um, you know, Kakoli uh, uh, did mention it already, freedom of capital was introduced on the 1st of July 1990. And this was linked later linked to the first stage of the European MU by the Master GT 92. In my view, uh, this was an important date because um, it pulls down, uh, it pulls down already one of the most important bastions of national e um, uh, economic policy. And in my view also, this date may uh, already fix somehow a point of no return. Um, the other criteria um, I mentioned flexibility of ages, labor mobility are not fulfilled. Uh, uh, although you know freedom of movement for workers is legally guaranteed by the treaty. Um, this causes, of course, economic, a lot of economic and social disparities between the MU member countries, putting the uh, MU at risk, even of its collapse as a whole operating away of those members who are under pressure because of significant disparities. Um, in the latter case, perhaps, maybe, that a hard core of countries 
which have already uh, linked their currencies together before the first stage started, namely Germany, the Netherlands, and Austria, could or would remain. Uh, this area, it's uh, uh, fascinating somehow, is nearly identical with the Holy Roman Empire of the German state. And the um, OCA economists have really uh, confirmed in their empirical research uh, in the early 1990s that the optimum currency area would be somehow, without saying this, uh, this area I mentioned, uh, Netherlands, uh, Germany, or Austria, uh, Holy Roman Empire. Uh, a fascinating result of historical continuity and complex in my view. Uh, now, let us look uh, to the uh, separate question, how uh, it, would it be possible to minimize the risk that I mentioned above? And therefore, you need several compensation mechanisms. First uh, mechanism, you, need, you will need more funds for the union budget. But uh, to, uh, the idea is uh, you should, as, uh, there should be established some kind of um, how the economists call it, fiscal equalization system. Um, it's just the same you can find in uh, European federal states. Um, in a, this should be provided more effectively than it is done by the structural funds that we have already in the union budget because this money is too less. Um, last but not least, this could lead to somehow into a transfer union, which is a, 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 a word uh, being now uh, rather controversial because some countries don't like it. Uh, I, I, I do not mention, I, I must not mention uh, which countries uh, these are. Uh, more funds, you can do it by augmenting national contributions to the uh, EU budget. Or you, uh, if this would turn out to be impossible or not sufficient by introducing taxes, union taxes, in particular income taxes, and this would mean partly centralization of uh, taxation policy, it could be called tax union. The second group of uh, uh, mechanisms, compensation mechanisms, could be, or there will be, will be, you, need, you will need more union competences. That's to say, this means centralization in the field of, economic, of income policy, of social policy, employment and labor market policy, uh, in particular to improve the comparative advantages and thus the competitiveness of uh, the EU economies. And this can be viewed as elements of some kind of social union. Uh, last but not least, the, main, the, the most important point in my view is that we, all this will lead into a political union. Um, because only a political union could guarantee all the functioning of these compensation mechanisms, because dealing with, with economic and social disparities and activating compensation mechanisms causes, of course, political and social conflicts enormous conflicts, and this needs political support, and above all, don't forget it, uh, democratic legitimacy. Uh, centralization of monetary policy alone, which we now have by the EU, um, will, would turn out as insufficient, because uh, the limits of a purely economic integration idea and it, in addition to that, the deficits of political legitimacy of the independent European Central Bank, the ECB, would become evident. Um, let me now have, uh, have a short look to the uh, budgetary resources that we have uh, on the um, EU level. What if, in your opinion, is the percentage share of the union budget uh, in relation to the European 
uh, GNI, GNI means uh, gross national income at market prices. It's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 percent. It's month, month, month. A, a little more than one month percent in the present EU financial framework 2007 to 2013. The maximum percentage of the so called budgetary commitment of preparations amounts to 1.1 percent European GNI, and the maximum percentage of payment of preparations is this is the money in cash is, uh, which is spent. Um, amounts to 1.2% uh, of GNI. These are peanuts in value uh, in comparison to the budget shares of the uh, uh, nation states. Uh, all this I, I repeat myself was well known in the world of, uh, of academic uh, economics since um, 61 when Mandel published his famous article. Uh, and you can see that this, this famous Maastricht criteria, the uh, deficit ratio and the, the debt, debt ratio is really not sufficient as a basis uh, for uh, a decision to try the, the, the monetary issue. Let me sum up uh, this part of my statement I hope I hope it will not be too tiring as we up to now. Um, first, uh, first point, building the MEU has enormous impacts, which you should be aware. It has enormous impacts on more centralization in other policy areas for compensating the risks when the OCA conditions are not fulfilled. Second point, only a political union can at last guarantee all the functioning of these compensation mechanisms for reasons of necessary political support, support and democratic legitimacy. Third point, uh, the less homogeneous the MU area, the greater the economic and social disparities within the area, the more intensive these impacts and tendencies for centralization towards a political Union uh, will turn out. Um, these are uh, not unknown things because, in principle, we can uh, identify the same problems in the national context uh, when we look on the monetary, social, economic, and political system of any nation state before joining the uh, uh, EU. If you're for joining a MU with other nation states, you can find the same problem within a nation state. You have regions with different uh, uh, regional standards, and therefore you need money to compensate it. It's in principle the same problems. Um, let me now come to um, um, some strategies which are followed by the European political class to avoid um, a collapse in any case. What can we um, observe uh, in particular in those in the days and weeks and months ago? Uh, we, we can see, um, besides CMU, uh, some sector elements of union uh, concepts. I mentioned already transfer union, social union, tax union, economic union, and what we see in particular after the impression of the present financial crisis is in my view uh, um, not a new institutional uh, element, it's more uh, some kind of, I would call it patchwork, and more or less convulsive, sometimes even desperate and legally, even legally doubtful attempts to establish mechanisms under the legal uh, regime of the Lisbon Treaty only to improve uh, effectiveness of the political backing of crisis management. Um, I restrict myself um, only on four institutional aspects. On the European level, 
And I will leave out all technical details of financial operations, uh, debt release, aircraft granting, easier terms of payment, and so on. Um, and because I am sure that I am not a banking expert. Uh, the first element of this patchwork. Um, it is the French idea, uh, which, which was raised again by uh, Monsieur Sarkozy, um, the idea of a gouvernement économique, economic government. Um, this is in line with an old French uh, tradition based on the typical French tradition of étatisme, uh, going back to Colbert. Colbert was the French minister of Louis XIV, uh, Louis XIV. And this conflict delicately with the anti etatist neoliberal mainstream, uh, which perhaps will be overcome, I hope it will be overcome by the present, but under the influences of the present crisis. Uh, Sarkozy revived this old idea by setting up, the idea was uh, setting up the Euro group in the composition of the heads of state or government. Um, up to now, um, the Eurogroup was only uh, was under the composition of the finance ministers and the uh, presidents of the national uh, central banks. Um, and the European leaders agreed uh, on stressing the necessity of the existing coordination procedures among all 27 member states. Well, Mrs. Uh, Angela Merkel was not really happy with this idea because uh, the German uh, Bundesbank uh, does not lack uh, uh, political influences. And uh, in, there was an informal European Council meeting on uh, 7 November 2008, and she said that the Council on the composition of the heads of state of government is of course a body dealing with economic questions. Just call it economic government. Just call it economic government. Uh, you can see um, it's, it's, it's you can see that uh, she was not very happy. Uh, three years later, uh, a few months ago in March this year, um, this led to the so-called Euro Plus Act which was also called, I think you uh, right, uh, competitiveness pack. Yeah. Um, uh, agreed by the uh, Eurozone heads of state or government and confirmed by the European Council. And this was not really a, a fundamental new thing. Um, it was intended, uh, member states, the pact, what was the pact? The pact was, Member states made commitments to a list of political reforms which are intended to improve fiscal tracks as well as coordination of economic policies. You, uh, 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 um, strengthening coordination is a permanent formula you can find in the communiques of the meetings. Uh, this was advocated by the French and German governments and it was again a compromise, a typical French-German compromise, uh, is of the compromise, um, the, the, uh, the expression of a compromise um, between the French etatism and the German reserves against uh, the gouvernement uh, économique. Um, this was the second, um, the second uh, element of the patchwork. The third element you can observe that some important persons are dreaming. Are really dreaming. Uh, ECB, e, 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 CB President Jean-Claude Trichet, he is dreaming of a European finance ministry on the occasion uh, of being awarded with the Karls Preis in Aachen uh, uh, recently. The President of the Eurogroup, Jean-Claude Juncker, is dreaming of Euro bonds, uh, which should be emitted by a special debt agency in the name of all Eurozone members instead of the present debt regime being managed independently by each member state. 
The idea is um, this should equalize interest rates, in particular by reducing the high interest rates for countries facing financial difficulties because of the higher risk uh, in these countries. On the other hand, it would mean higher interest rates uh, for a more stable economies like Germany, that's being, of course, strictly imposed by these countries. Um, and the debt agency finally could become the core of a future European monetary fund. It's a blueprint, of course, uh, up to now. Uh, this is proposed, was, has been proposed by already by several prominent political leaders. The uh, fourth element, and this will be uh, the last one, you know um, the famous no bailout clause. Uh, what does it mean? Um, this was introduced by the Maastricht Treaty, that is now Article 125 of the Lisbon Treaty, state, stating that the Union and any member state as well shall not be liable for or assume the commitment of national governments of any member state or another member state respectively. Um, this clause remarks uh, an important difference in the financial regulation um, which you can find in, the, uh, in some federal uh, nation states and their system of fiscal fed, um, federalism. Um, I cannot go in, uh, deeper in, into the details. Can we summarize? Um? Can we somehow summarize that? And, uh, how many times do you need? Um, you know, I, I, can, I can close it in, in, in half a minute uh, because the rest are only um, statements to stimulate discussion. Because uh, uh, I should like to give a room for the debate. Yeah, okay. okay. Um, if the uh, nowhere clause is clear, then I can... No, no, no. Uh, okay. It's, uh, um, happy you, but... Uh, it, it, was, uh, um, it was agreed in the uh, December European Council uh, last, uh, last year, 2010. Uh, it was agreed a two-line amendment to the treaty to be introduced, inserted into Article uh, 136. Um, it, it was very tricky because um, referendums should be avoided. And the formula reads as follows. The member states whose currency is the euro may establish a stability mechanism to be, be activated if indispensable to safeguard the stability of the euro area as a whole. The granting of any required financial assistance under the mechanism will be made subject to strict conditionality. Um, but this would mean was not set yet. Um, and you know, uh, consequently, the European Stability Mechanism, ESM, as a permanent rescue funding program was institutionalized uh, in March uh, 2011, but this will come into force uh, at the middle of 2013. Up to now, we have the other uh, strange animal called uh, EFSF, that means uh, European Financial Stability Facilitator. And uh, the most controversial point had been in the last days uh, how um, it could succeed to uh, contribute uh, private creditors uh, to the uh, rescue packages. And this was the outcome of this meeting yesterday. Okay, uh, then I We'll finish. Uh, I, I gave you in, in the written statement a uh, uh, third section uh, where I formulated some questions for to stimulate or uh, to provoke discussion, but you can read it. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much. It was uh, really interesting, and I uh, do very hope that uh, we can create a, a book from these articles and uh, everybody can. Uh, read and, and also uh, to answer for uh, the problems you write. 
And uh, not only the more ex excuse me that uh, I'm trying to be really short on that, but uh, you know that we have to calculate in the time. And uh, now I, I would ask uh, uh, Janusz Plantner uh, that uh, to give you a lecture and, and, and uh, let me try uh, to remain within the time limit. Push the button. It is here somewhere. No, it's, it's, it's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. Yeah, it's on. It's on. Yeah, 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 it's on. Yeah,